This is lecture 11. We're going to get into specificity of adaptation. Uh, this is a topic we've introduced before, but we'll start getting into some more detail now. This will be a two-part uh, series. In lecture 12, we'll get more into applications. But in this one, we're going to go over some definitions. Um, a little bit of history. I know history, but there's five names um, who have contributed to how we know what we know. And then we'll talk about what tissues adapt and the reason that they do. Uh, but let's talk about adaptation in general. First, we're just constantly changing. Every second of your life is undergoing some sort of change to be better fit to the environmental conditions you find yourself in. Uh, now, some of this happens at the level of the species, like those huge ears there. Um, uh, hearing is a selective pressure for survival. So, you know, let's get the BFG ears going. Uh, and some of it is at the level of the individual. Uh, enzymes, for example, these are always changing behaviors and, and concentrations based on your daily activities. Which is why Costco now sells coffins, right? You have to sell them in bulk because pretty much everything kills us. Uh, and this goes back to homeostasis, our, our body's internal regulation of heat and pH and gas pressures and blood pressure and sugar and cholesterol and everything else. Our body self-regulates um, all of that stuff in a very narrow window. And our environments are constantly disrupting it, which can be lethal. Um, or it can be sublethal, but it's still threatening. Um, now, you don't need to know this slide. This is just a nice passage about what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Uh, that line, generally credited to Nietzsche. Uh, this is one of the last essays Christopher Hitchens wrote before dying of cancer. And he points out that the expression is perhaps falser than it is true. Um, and so how we respond to loads and stressors and environmental threats depends on a lot. Sometimes we respond in a way that makes us stronger, but sometimes we don't. So toleration, um, the first getting into some of our definitions here, this is just making do, right? You don't adapt. Um, if you fly on a plane with an infant next to you, I, I doubt there's going to be much adaptation happening. You just endure it and then move on with your life. Um, alcohol tolerance is different. That's an actual adaptation. It's about alcohol dehydrogenase in, in the in the stomach mostly. Um, but toleration, we're, we're not thinking of actual adaptation. Uh, habituation, this is to become less sensitive move next to a mushroom plant and you'll stop smelling it after a while. At first it'll it'll stink, but then you'll stop smelling it. Uh, if you live next to a train, you'll hear it a lot at first, but after a while you'll stop hearing it. And my favorite example is uh, from Princess Bride, both in the movie and in the book. This is the passage in the book uh, where they talk about the fire swamp. And at first it's punishing, but over time you grow used to it. So that would be habituation. Sensitization. Uh, this is becoming more sensitive to things. So if you're a musician, then you can tune your instrument by ear uh, over time, right? Maybe not at first, you need the tuner. But as you play and play and, and become have a, have a uh, finer tuned ear, you'll have a finer tuned instrument. Uh, or like a sommelier, you, you taste and smell qualities in wine with training. Um, so we become more sensitive. That's sensitization. Uh, just a look at the definition. So make sure you can tell that these two apart, um, not just by definition, but also by example. Uh, if, I, if I give an example, you should be able to identify the difference. Um, so moving next to a dairy farm and not smelling it anymore, right? That might be an example. Uh, learning to read Braille, right? That could be an example. And knowing which of these uh, that is. So moving into accommodation and adaptation. Um, the last time you got into a hot tub, just think about that. At first, the water pr probably felt scorching, right? Way too hot to get in. Um, Maybe you stand there with your calves submerged and sort of slowly creep into the hot tub. Uh, then after a minute, you finish your plunge, right? You submerge after yeah, 30 seconds or whatever, however long it takes to accommodate. 
Um, same thing would happen in a shower. Maybe you get in and at first it's really hot and then it doesn't feel as hot anymore. So you turn up the shower and turn up the shower and turn up the shower, you know, over the course of several minutes. Um, so that would be accommodation. Um, you just get used to stuff and it happens quickly, right? You, your body develops a tolerance, right? To the immediate stress very quickly. Uh, a better example would be pupil dilation. Your pupils are constantly adjusting to light. I, you know, afternoon sunlight or a dark room, these create very different responses, but both are quick to set in um, and quick to depart. Uh, but if a, if a bright, sunshiny day caused the cells in your eyeballs to multiply, that would be hyperplasia, or grow, right, that would be hypertrophy, or shrink, atrophy, uh, or change their cell type, metaplasia, and those changes were relatively permanent, that would be adaptation. Not accommodation, but adaptation. And tanning is a good example of adaptation. Tans don't come and go as quickly as pupils change their uh, dilation. And the stimulus is responded to in a chronic way. It's not permanent, but it's relatively permanent. So tanning is a form of adaptation. Summarizing these terms, uh, accommodation is the opposite of intolerance, right? I'm, I'm intolerant to heat. I'm intolerant to the cold. I can't make short-term changes uh, in my body to accommodate them. Um, so that would be just knowing those differences. And these are the five terms that you'll need to know. Uh, genetic adaptation is at the level of the species, right? Ducks fly. They need greasy breast meat. Chickens don't fly. They don't need greasy breast meat. Um, giraffes eat from the treetops. They need long necks. Ant eaters eat from ant hills or whatever. So they need really long, creepy noses. And uh, the individual won't adapt, right? The giraffe's neck won't get longer by eating from higher. It's, it's at the level of the species. There's evolutionary pressures that are weeding out the critters who are unfit to their environment. So that would be genetic adaptation or evolution. Getting into specificity of adaptation, uh, let's start with some history. Um, the most famous name that everyone associates specificity of adaptation with is Wolf, right? Julius Wolf. He was a German anatomist. Um, and his book, Wolf's book, describes the metabolism of bones and how their architecture um, is altered by mechanical loading. And his law, right, Wolf's law, was that the nature of the load made a difference in how bones. Uh, are remodeled. So increase it and the bone would strengthen its ability to resist and tolerate that stress. Remove it and the bone would begin to weaken. Uh, but also the characteristics of the load matter, uh, how they bear the weight, how much weight is there torsion or compression? Is it bending in some particular angle? Um, the bone will adapt accordingly. Uh, now, Henry Gassett Davis published his book 25 years before Wolf. He came first. Uh, he was an American orthopedic surgeon, and he had some really rudimentary peripheral commentary about the specificity of adaptation in ligaments, um, quote, or any other soft tissue. That's, he specified that. Um, and he explained that they would adapt to stretching forces with a lengthening response, so stretch your tissues and they get stretchier, right? That's very basic, but so was Wolf's law. His, his law was simple too. So Davis's law is considered a corollary to Wolf's law. Now today we know that all living cells and tissues adapt according to the specificity of the stresses and the loads and the other demands that are placed on them. Uh, it's not just bones and ligaments. Uh, remember the organ systems we talked about in the first lecture, um, all of that stuff adapts. I mean, energy pathways, that's one example. Your metabolism will change permanently-ish uh, to be more fit to whatever the energy demands are. Uh, if the stress is aerobic, uh, you'll restructure your metabolism to support that. If it's less aerobic, you adjust accordingly. If you eat more or less, you'll adjust accordingly. Enzymes are a topic we'll get into in much deeper uh, detail. 
in the third block, they're the basis of your metabolism, the regulators of all of your chemical reactions, most at least of your chemical reactions. And so for example, hypertrophy and atrophy are governed by enzymes and the concentration and behaviors of those enzymes are adapting now based on the profile of stresses you're experiencing, whatever it is that you're doing while watching or listening, that is influencing uh, your enzymes. Mitochondria are also going to adapt. Uh, you can increase or decrease the quantity of them and not just numbers, but the function uh, that can change too, in part owing to uh, mitochondrial enzyme concentrations. And the same is true for transporters. GLUT4, glucose transporter 4 it would be one example, right? This is the transporter that insulin activates, uh, which escorts sugar into fat and muscle cells. Um, but that's just one transporter, right? GLUT2 is another one that tra uh, transports glucose between the blood and liver. Um, GLUT5, right? That's a fructose transporter in the intestines and elsewhere. Uh, and we haven't even left sugar transporters yet. Uh, large neutral amino acid transporters, that's how you escort certain amino acids into the brain. There are thyroid um, uh, transport proteins, transport the thyroid hormones uh, into the cell, and, and a million other examples, a million examples of, of uh, transporters that adapt specifically to your stresses and behaviors. Um, and just like the transporters, receptors can change in um, concentration or, or, or they can decrease and, in, in, you know, uh, increase or decrease. And so think about like acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate uh, or GABA receptors. Um, increasing the number of those increases the effect of the neurotransmitter. Uh, if it's a hormone, the receptors are critical to the hormone's function. So insulin does nothing in the blood. Uh, it has to bind to its receptor to exert its action. And the same is true for testosterone and estrogen and growth hormone. I, for, I just name a hormone and, it, and, and that's true. We need our receptors. Um, and those receptors change specifically according to the stresses and other environmental conditions. Gene expression, uh, this is another one. This is at the foundation of most of these changes. Um, your genes will increase or decrease the translation of proteins, synthesis of proteins, based on their exposure to environmental stresses um, or imposed stresses like exercise, self-imposed stresses or diet or any other behavior. Um, any encounter, environmental or imposed, um, genes are going to be changing their behavior, uh, and that behavior results in permanent-ish adaptation. Every gland is going to undergo change as well. Uh, we'll talk about glands and their hormones later this semester, but uh, I mentioned the pituitary because it's a major governing gland. Uh, the pituitary releases stuff on its own, but it's also in control of the gonads if you're going to release testosterone or estrogen. It governs the thyroid if you're going to release you know, T3, T4. Uh, the adrenal gland is under control of the pituitary if you're going to release cortisol. Uh, the pituitary is a major hub, and um, it's, it's like an international connecting airport, um, but all of those glands uh, are going to change based on your exposures. The immune system is also constantly adapting to the threats that it's exposed to. If you're not regularly exposing any biological system to stress, uh, you're not giving that system a workout. And any chunk of your biology that ceases to be worked out will atrophy. The slow loss of capacity in the absence of stress just applies to every body system, um, most of which are scarcely considered. And many of these systems are, are critical to athletic potential as well. Your immune system doesn't just fight off infections. It's part of the signaling for muscle metabolism. Immune system function is critical. Um, it, it's a big contributor to hypertrophy after workouts. Um, and even your cartilage, your articular cartilage, which is completely avascular and until recently, everyone thought was unadaptable tissue. This will be strengthened in, in ways that enable it to better tolerate the stresses being endured. 
Um, so everything is adapting, but why do these systems adapt uh, according to the law of specificity of adaptation? Um, Andrew Marvell, he's an old poet, politician. He said it first, uh, or at least he wrote it first. He, that's the earliest record we have of this, which is that self-preservation, nature's first great law. Those were his words in the 17th century. He was talking about self preservation. Just like size principle exists for our survival and reflex arcs exist for our survival and pretty much everything else that doesn't exist solely for reproduction exists for our survival, so does specificity of adaptation. Practically everything in your body is in a constant state of change and that change, those adaptations, will be very specific according to the stresses imposed upon it, just as Wolf and Davis uh, acknowledged in the 19th century. Um, but we didn't come to appreciate this phenomenon uh, the moment they published their works. The most famous name in stress adaptation is Hans Selye. Uh, he published 33 books, depending on what you count as a book, uh, more than 1,600 scientific articles, very prolific uh, researcher. And a lot of it was really high impact, really highly celebrated. Uh, and almost everything he wrote was on the subject of stress and the physiological responses to it. The Stress of Life was his most famous book, but he spent his life uh, publishing on this topic. And the first major publication of his on this subject was in Nature, a uh, really good journal in the 1930s, around the 4th of July. And so Selye was doing endocrinological research, injecting rats with hormones and he, you know, testing the effects. Uh, some of the rats became sick. And he thought, well, maybe it's like the hormones. Maybe it's what I'm injecting that's, that's doing it. Um, so I'll, incl I'll include a, a control group and see what happens. And they got sick too. The control group got sick too. So it's the stress. That's what he concluded. General sickness response to whatever goes in. Uh, that was that was the conclusion he came to. And, and this is the article. It's, it's very short. Um, a syndrome produced by diverse innocuous uh, agents. And uh, he talks about all these different stresses, cold exposure, surgical injury, spinal shock, muscular stress, uh, drug exposure like formaldehyde. And he says, quote, a typical syndrome appears. Uh, this is what he calls GAS, G-A-S, General Adaptation Syndrome, GAS. Uh, we respond generally, uh, no matter what stress is applied, uh, however specific the threat or load or harm, we respond generally. Um, so, you know, the nervous system and endocrine system initiate a fight or flight response and a typical syndrome appears uh, in response to whatever the variety of stress is uh, that we encounter. Uh, at the end of his, again, very short article, he talks about general alarm reaction, and that's good. That's actually true. Um, the immediate response is a general one. The immediate, very short response is general. Uh, so what you get is activation of both the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and uh, the sympathoadrenal medullary axis. Uh, both of these release stress hormones. That's what we call them, stress hormones. Now, one is a amine hormone. It's made from an amino acid. And the other is a steroid hormone, meaning it's made from cholesterol. Um, so on the right, that's the amine hormone being released, epinephrine. Um, adrenaline or epinephrine, those mean the same thing, being released from the adrenal medulla or medulla. Um, on the left, we get the steroid hormone released, cortisol. It's a corticosteroid, a glucocorticoid, cortisol, right, from the adrenal cortex, cortisol from the cortex. Um, slower time series on that one than epinephrine. Epinephrine is very rapid. Um, cortisol is not. 
But cortisol uh, strips your immune system at the same time. You don't need a robust immune system at the moment, right? You're stressed out by something more immediately threatening. So there's no need to pay attention to microscopic things when macroscopic things are endangering you. Um, and we'll come back to this diagram later in the semester when we're talking about hormones and their regulation. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how these axes work um, especially the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, but for now, uh, just know that both of these are going to stimulate the mobilization of energy resources. And the epinephrine will also increase cardiovascular responsiveness. Now, our immediate stress response um, is more complicated than Cellier's physiological understanding could account for. Back then, Nobody knew about the range of physiological responses to a source of stress. One additional response um, that was discovered kind of recently comes from your bones, right? From your skeleton uh, comes osteocalcin. Um, levels should be pretty elevated within a few minutes. Heart rate goes up, you know, body temperature, blood glucose respond to. Uh, without osteocalcin, the response to danger isn't as pronounced. Uh, in animals, you can get a stress response independent of epinephrine. Uh, what, all, what osteocalcin does is inhibit a parasympathetic drive, right? The, the parasympathetic calm you down nervous system. Um, and in the, in the place of adrenal insufficiency, osteocalcin can take up the torch. Uh, but Selye goes on to talk about general adaptation syndrome. General alarm reaction, yes, true. But he goes on to talk about general adaptation syndrome, and that's kind of nonsense. Um, you know, parts of it are. Uh, overtraining conditions, that has a lot of general systemic responses. But in most cases, uh, in most people, in most situations, our chronic response is not generalized. The initial reaction may be, uh, but not what our bodies do in the long term. Uh, now down here at the very end of his first publication, he, he talks about habituation or inurement. Uh, Habituation is an odd choice of vernacular. You know what that means. Uh, and inurement just means grow accustomed to hardship, some pain or difficulty, you become accustomed to it. Um, in specific types of stress, this nomenclature describes our adaptation well, but adaptation is a much bigger concept uh, than this would indicate. So let's say one of these happens to you. Uh, you're, you are hugged by a very stinky person or you're exposed to really cold weather or to really hot weather uh, or you're stung by some bees. Your appetite is just out of hand. Allergies happen. You're punched. You know, No matter what is causing your stress, physical or emotional, psychological, whatever, you will enter an alarm phase which jolts your physiology into panic mode. Uh, you experience different amounts of panic, stress, of alarm, whatever you want to call it. But brief panic is physiologically similar. Um, the adaptation, though, the, the adaptation is different. The stress itself matters in determining what the adaptation uh, will be. Uh, but not really according to Cellier. Cellier would just say you're experiencing different doses of a general stress. Um, so if you're a rat and you're wearing another rat's carcass as a winter coat, that's probably stressful. Um, if you've recently lost all of your limbs and you're experiencing hypothermia at the same time, those are entirely different stresses. And this is the most extreme, ridiculous example I could think of, but you get the idea. Different acute stressors result in a similar panic, but the chronic adaptation will differ. 
Uh, now, there will be redundancies. We'll talk about that in just a second. Cycling and jogging uh, are going to result in some overlapping adaptations, but also a lot of unique physiological responses. Um, so about a decade after Selye's first paper, uh, his was from 1936, this is from 1945, Thomas DeLorme, um, that's another name to keep in mind, um, he showed specificity of adaptation in a weight room. It was rudimentary, lift heavy and get more power, lift light and, and experience more endurance, you know, stuff like that. He had a lot more than that, but it was themes like that. And he published it in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Um, he was an army physician and he was working with World War II soldiers, exper experimenting with uh, new rehabilitation techniques. So that's why it's published in a surgery journal. But in the 1940s, we're seeing specificity of responses uh, to specific exercise stress. Then in the 1950s, Edward Adolph, uh, did the real pioneering research on specificity of adaptation, where he showed that there is some overlap and unique adaptations to any stressor imposed on your body. Um, and that came out, that paper came out in 1956, submitted in 54, came out in 56. Um, so in his introduction, he writes, it has been widely supposed, talking about Selye here, that adaptations to various stressors have much in common. Um, so he's insulting Selye without calling him out by name. Um, and then in the end of his article, as he's concluding, he insults Selye a little bit more directly, not by name, but by his nomenclature. Uh, so I'll just read it. Adaptates overlap. For instance, adaptation to high altitude is not wholly separate from adaptation to cold air. Nevertheless, the combination of manifestations found uh, is specific to the stressor. Although this, po this possibility has been heretofore recognized, it has been neglected in the belief that the general syndrome predominates, obviously talking about Selye. The tally of specific instances now shows that adaptates are not the same for several stressors. So uh, these are the three names to know, other than Wolf and Davis, right? There's Wolf, there's Davis, uh, and then there's, in the 1940s, we have Thomas DeLorme, specificity of adaptation in a weight room. All you need to know about that. Uh, 1930s, and for the next several decades, Hans Selye, general adaptation syndrome. And then in the 1950s, we have Edward Adolph, specificity of adaptation as we understand it today. Um, specific with some marginal bits of overlap. Uh, but the primary point is that each cell and tissue and system adapts very specifically according to the nature of the stress it was exposed to. Uh, so in summary, our bodies respond to nearly everything we experience. Um, sometimes we just tolerate our environmental stressors and get on with our lives. Uh, sometimes we accommodate temporarily pupil dilation being an example of that. And other times we adapt. Um, if we adapt, we do so very specifically. Uh, there will be some overlap to similar stressors, but not that much. It's surprisingly little. Uh, when I was at my weightlifting peak, I wasn't any better at the monkey bars or, or climbing a rope uh, than I was at any other point in my life. Um, and like one form of cardiovascular exercise doesn't really translate to another, doesn't really prepare you uh, for another. So being a world-class swimmer doesn't make you good at cycling. Uh, and there are a thousand other examples I could give, but let's just move on to our review questions, which are these. Uh, make sure you can answer these questions and we'll finish up specificity of adaptation in the next lecture becoming a little bit more practical in our applications of it. So that will be lecture 12 uh, and the last lecture before the first exam. Um, so I'll see you one more time before the big day.